Uh, thanks for tuning in to another broadcast of Unleash Independence. We have our uh, special guest, but first let me welcome on Brock J, co-founder. Thanks, Brock, for coming on. All right, thanks, Cameron. And then our special guest is LG, which means life is good, right, libertarian girl? <laughs> you could look at it that way if you'd like to. All right. Hey, thanks for uh, spending your time and coming on with us today and talking and talking to us. I appreciate it. It's my pleasure. So what we want to talk to you about is independence. That's what we're all about, um, helping people become uh, independent, uh, pushing this perspective that you own your life rather than another, another individual. So I want to ask you, and it's kind of an abstract or a hard question, um, but the best that you could answer it, what is independence to you? What does it mean to you? And, um, and we'll start there. So I think independence is not falling in line just because it's what everyone else is doing. And I think one of the most courageous things that, that you can do is to not only think independently, but to publicly declare a state of intellectual independence and act on it. I, I started off as sort of a um, half-hearted Republican, meaning I was always socially liberal in that I don't want anyone telling me how to live my personal life, so I afford everyone that same respect. And so from that, I just started learning more about libertarianism and speaking out about it. In terms of liber liberty, everything that you post on Facebook, um, what, how do you think libertarianism applies to self-ownership? If someone's not sure that they, they say, I'm an independent, I don't like to pick a, a political party, and I also don't want to pick any or promote any candidates, um, but so they're just uncertain, they haven't really done much research. How can being libertarian philosophically apply to becoming, I mean, apply more to self-ownership? Well, and I like to make it clear that I, you know, I'm not a card-carrying member of the Libertarian Party. When it comes to my views on self-ownership and politics, I take everything by an issue-by-issue -issue basis. And as far as candidates go, I analyze it on again by issues and what I think would be best in whichever situation. So I think libertarianism affords people the ability to be under this huge umbrella of beliefs, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to vote one way or another. I think some people get too caught up in, we can only be Republican, we can only be Libertarian, or, or none of the above. It's, so it's good that you're looking at the, the actual issues and not the, uh, the, the, the labels. Yeah, parties are just vessels to promote your agenda. Well, especially when you're talking about the Libertarian Party, which is just talking about, you know, individuals and owning your own life. I think that that's a great example of what you're talking about, Mary. You know, Brock and I, let me, let me back up a little bit. Brock and I have had some discussions on this. And, you know, like you guys are talking about endorsing ideas rather than individuals. Um, but how do you kind of toe that line when you find somebody that you really want to endorse or bring forth or you think is going to help increase independence? Um, what, what steps or what process are you taking? I think you have to completely analyze every single thing or issue, stances on issues that a certain candidate has. And I'm not the kind of person that believes that I will ever find a perfect candidate because it's, just, it's not possible. So again, it's all about analyzing things on an issue-by-issue -issue basis and figuring out what you can live with, what your priorities are. So my priorities are economics and deregulation. I put that above social issues no matter what, because if we don't have an economy, if people don't have jobs, they can't feed themselves, then social issues don't even matter because you won't be alive. I agree. Like, if you, I mean, I'm not a full supporter of Milton Friedman, but I know I, he did some things on, uh, I think it was Hong Kong and some other places, talking about how we need to get economic freedom and then the rest of them will fall in line. Have you done much research on that? On what, Milton Friedman? Yeah, just his philosophy of going after uh, economic freedom, and once we get economic freedom, it's easier because we have the time and the money to get the rest of our freedoms back. Yeah, exactly, and I... When I, when I talk about peace and like world peace, I fully believe that the only way for peace to come is to give everyone economic freedom and allow them the ability to do whatever they want with their lives as long as they are not harming another person. 
So do you think that having a secular view is the best way to approach it rather than just, um, you know, because when we listen to Ron Paul talk, you know, he says that we're, we have civil rights, we have economic rights, he says, but why are we distinguishing them? We have rights. So do you think that, I mean, I, I, I understand what you're saying. Ultimately, it works the same thing because they are the same thing, but do you think that we need to continue with this paradigm uh, or this, you know, uh, dichotomy where there's, you know, two separate things instead of looking at it as one? I think you can look at it as one. I think it's fully possible to say that it all fits under just one giant umbrella of liberty and freedom, as whether it's your personal issues or economic. Yeah, and I, I actually agree with that. You can look at one, but uh, I think we also have to look at, we got we to gotta be careful with trying to define things in new ways, because as soon as we do that, we're kind of like, shun off a lot of people because they don't even know what we're saying. So if we use terms that they're familiar with, sometimes they can, it, people are more willing to accept it because they're familiar with that idea. How do you think, or what is the best way, you know, what, what uh, process are you taking to get this message out? I mean, if you're for independence, if you're for, you know, this, and you're, you say that you own your life rather than someone else. So what, what steps are you taking? What solutions are you finding that are working to help wake people up to the fact that they own their life rather than someone else? As far as what I do day to day is I try and make issues relatable. So, you know, you can talk about ending the Fed and but most people are at the Fed, what, they don't even know what the Fed is. So if you bring it down to a personal level where you say, okay, well, if, if we end the Fed, then you're essentially going to have more money in your pocket. So it's just a matter of simplifying our message and issues to a way that they can relate to your daily life. And I think that a lot of libertarians have a problem with that because we tend to be logical to a fault. I so agree with that. I've been saying that for a while. <laughs> we, we take something simple, we make it complex, and I think sometimes our ego gets in the way of that. So thank you for trying to keep things simple. <laughs> That's very good. Um, so what I've been seeing from um, your page, I, by the way, anyone, uh, we've talked about this before, but if you haven't been to uh, Libertarian Girls' Facebook page, check it out. I love, you have the best memes that I find anywhere else. <laughs> And they do. You really are able to, uh, with whatever you're posting, uh, kind of boil things down to a re relatable level. I think that's uh, that's that's the key. You know, we we talk about it and joke about it all the time, but you know, keep it simple, stupid. And that, I think that's a good thing. You know, don't don't make it into this grand. You know, making mountains out of molehills. Mole really, um, the problems that we're facing are so. Uh, you know, out of proportion that uh, we need people to comprehend what we're doing or, or what we think. Um, Brock, I want to ask you though, when we're talking about ownership, uh, I don't know that we really had your opinion on here as far as um, specifically what does that mean to you? What does self-ownership mean to you? Uh, I think it just depends on what aspect we're talking. If we're talking politically, Self-ownership just means you get to choose what you want to do as long as you don't infringe on those natural rights that you're, are there when you're born. Um, if you're talking more in a philosophical sense, um, I think it's more if you want to, if you own yourself, you kind of have to look inwards to figure out who you truly are, and then you can kind of go from there. And then once you master yourself, you can master things on the outside. Very interesting. What are your, what are your thoughts to what Brock had to say, Mary? I, I completely agree. I don't think I don't think uh, there's much that we're going to disagree on. <laughs> well, maybe we can talk about something that we don't all agree on. Uh, little, changing gears a little bit, we're very, uh, very much on the same page. So good. Uh, we want to own our lives. That's the message. Okay, moving on. Um, I want to talk. I see that you've been talking a lot about Rand Paul, and we've talked about politicians a bit. Um, and yeah, you're not going to find everyone you completely endorse. And I agree with what you're what you're talking about. Um, his his uh, actions with the drones, uh, with the you know the economy. Um, I really respect him and I give him credit where it's due. But one thing that I think he kind of lacks on, and maybe you can comment to this, um, what I would like to see him improve on or or kind of move his stance on is is foreign policy and war. 
Um, that's what I loved about when I when I heard Ron Paul. I agreed with him on all this stuff, and he he was a great educator and mentor. But you, when he talked about foreign policy, he talked about the drone strikes killing other you know killing kids and and people in other countries and these senseless wars. You could tell that it was pa he was passionate about it. It really got to him, and I want to see that in somebody. But I want to get your opinion. What do you what what is attractive to Rand to you? Okay, so let me ask you this. Have you seen his speech at the Heritage Foundation on foreign policy? Uh, I don't believe that I have. Okay, because I think that that would clear a lot of um, a lot of your concerns up. What he talked about there was how our foreign policy has become so monolithic. The debate is just, it's barely there, if at all. And so you see that we now have the pro-war left and the pro-war right. So it's just completely encompassed both parties. And what Rand tried to do at the Heritage Foundation, and I don't know if you know anything about the Heritage Foundation, it's like home of the neocons. But Jim DeMint just now started to work for the Heritage Foundation, and he's more libertarian. So hopefully that will start to change the policy and so he talked about how he is a rationalist or a realist about foreign policy where we need to be cautious and realize that radical Islam is a threat, but not, I guess, um, aggravate them with our occupations and exacerbate the situation. So he is starting to bring that libertarian flair to foreign policy. And that's good, and I, and I like to see that. Um, the, I guess what worries me is when we hear, you know, I hear him talk about, um, you know, the emphasis sometimes seems to be, we just need it to be legal. We need to just have it go to the Congress and have them have a declaration and everything. And of course I agree, yes, we should have legal wars, but I want someone that is actually hesitant to go to war. Not just, I mean, you know, that's, that's the thing. When we look at rights, when we look at, um, you, know, in, you know, owning our lives and everything, that's beyond the government. That, we're talking about a higher philosophy, a higher law. And I think that uh, when we're talking about going to war, killing people and everything, I want someone that is reluctant, that will resist war, and then if it has to be or something happens, we'll do it, uh, we'll do it legally. Um, but I just, I want to see more from that. I don't know. Brock, what do you think? Well, I think I'm kind of torn between it because I, I see the point of trying to bring everything. Like, I, I love it, the way Ron Paul explained foreign policy, but at the same time, I think this is this goes for the saying is what people fear most in this world is the unknown. And when we take something from here all the way to the extreme of no war, that scares everyone. Um, and I think Rand Paul's strategy is, is really good. Um, doesn't mean I agree with it fully. But I agree with his, I guess his philosophy on trying to change the strategy of trying to ease things back slowly so people aren't just fearful and just say no automatically. Yeah, I mean, you have to think that there are still people that think Iraq, the people of Iraq attacked us on 9-11. In this country, there are people that still believe that. So to, to think that we're going to go to this, you know, perfect policy of non-intervention that the Libertarian Party supposes is just, it's unrealistic to think that we're going to go from this to this overnight. It's just not going to happen. So, right. But it's really great that the conversation is going on and that Rand Paul is talking to Republicans and he's calling them out. He's calling them neocons. And that's what needs to happen. There needs to be someone in an office that is doing this, and he is. So that's great. Yeah, no, and I, and I'm happy with with what he's doing. Um, bringing this to to light and having this discussion is is half of the battle. You know, I mean, that's how um, opinions get changed. I mean, if we think about it, we look on some of these outrageous things that are being done. Um, I mean, two two things that come to mind right now are the Alex Jones, Pierre Mor Piers Morgan thing, and then the Rand Paul 13-hour filibuster. Um, those were ridiculous acts, in my opinion. They were awesome. They were stellar. And they got people to kind of break out of that daily trance, that routine of, you know, work, Fox News, bed, breakfast, you know, that whole, that whole thing. Break out of it and go, wait a second. That guy's loony, you know, or wait a second, that guy stood up for 13 hours. Um, so I, I appreciate what's being done, and, and it's waking people up, kind of breaking them out of that. 
But um, I wish that I just, I, I guess I just am hoping for more. I know there's no utopia right around the corner or anything like that, but war is something that's, I mean, it's a matter of life and death. It, it really is. I mean, I, I don't know if it could be any more, any more so. I mean, I don't think there's another topic that, that is. Um, anyways, I'm rambling on, but uh, what are your thoughts, Mary? I think that one of the main concerns, my concerns with war is, how much money we spend I mean it's just it's insane and us being in debt so much is more of a threat to our country than radical Islam could ever be why, why is it that people why do you think it is that people don't understand this and Brock you can weigh in too on that but when we when we're looking at the trillions the hundreds of trillions of unsecured debts and liabilities and we say you know all of a sudden now there's talk of uh, you know China and Russia and North Korea coming together and fight. I mean, you know, not to not to scare or anything, but I want your opinions because then we can find solutions on how to, you know, get people to think this way. But why is debt not a big issue to people? I mean, it is to the Tea Party years and stuff. But um, you know, Brock, what are you? What are your thoughts? Well, I wanted to make a point just on what Mary was saying, just the cost of this. And I, I saw something that it said. Uh, who, somebody asked the question, "Who is the biggest employer of all of the world?" And everyone's thinking McDonald's, Walmart, things like that. And it's the U.S. Department of Defense. And they have 2.3 million employees, if you want to call them that. Um, and I looked up the average salary of someone from that uh, sector, and it's 65000 a year. There's people below and above. But, I mean, it, on average, it's over $200 billion a year just for that. That doesn't include the bombs or the equipment or <laughs> anything like that. So... It, that's it's just just that alone just just blew my mind. So when you look at that, you take into consideration, you know, uh, the the research that you had done. I'm glad that you brought that up because I hadn't known that. Um, but when we're saying there's big superpowers, Russia, China, uh, North Korea is not a superpower, but you know, nuclear, they're a nuclear country, and they're talking about how sick and tired they are of the United States and working together. And we're saying it's okay, we're America, there are no problems, we don't have to really worry, but we are done. I mean, what if we did get into another war or a, a world war or something like that? Not to, it's not a fear thing. I'm just curious. Do people in your in your ma or your in your perspective? worry about the debt issue. How could we finance something like that? And then what would, what would that mean for America? So I guess my question coming full circle is identifying that and then what are the solutions to wake people up to understanding the threat of debt? Well, the threat of debt, uh, I think analogies are the best way to explain things because when they hear trillions of dollars and things like that, they'll never, they'll, they don't even know what that means. I mean, what was that? I think thing, thing, something Tony Robbins did was uh, when you count back how many seconds how many seconds ago was a million seconds ago? And then they go, uh, they have no idea, but it's 12 days. And then how many seconds ago was a billion? And they just, they have no idea. And it's 33 years because I totally got this wrong. And then how many seconds ago was a trillion? And that's actually 33,000 years ago. Uh, so when you <laughs> put that in perspective of what an actual trillion is, I mean, you can make a million dollars every day since Christ was born and you still wouldn't need another thousand years to become a trillionaire. I think things like that that makes them go, wait, like, we can't keep doing this. This, this, anything like that that just takes them out of their normal thinking, I think can help. Yeah, Mary, what are your thoughts? Um, you know, and it's using, using numbers like in the trillions, it's just, you know, it's so hard for people to comprehend. So I think I, Brock is right. You have to find a way to relate it. And I know that there are some really good graphics out there that show, you know, the pallets of money and how big a trillion dollars is in pallets. And so I think examples like that are really good to use. Um, but overall, we just need people to understand we cannot keep spending like this. Have you, uh, have you seen, because this relates to both what you guys are talking about, but there's that video um, where the guy takes all these pennies and he equa uh, equates each penny to 100 million dollars. Have you guys seen this video? Uh-uh. Okay, I'll have to link it, uh, but, but it's interesting because what he does is he talks about the, the, the debt, the wars, you know, all the stuff that the United States is spending money on. And so he has all these pennies, right? And he says this one penny represents 100 million dollars. And he talks about how much you could do with 100 million dollars, what islands you could buy, whose tuition you could pay for. And then he uh, basically just starts dumping pennies on the floor until there's this huge pile of pennies. And that is what equates to 
the amount of uh, of debt that we owe, or you know that that uh, we're in. Um, it's interesting. I'll link it up. So, I've got a question anyway. for you, Mary. Uh, what we talk a lot about, like Rand Paul and uh, all these guys on the on the national level. Do you think there's any way to control this debt? Because I see uh, a lot of things happening where the federal government starts bribing states to accept certain bills, whether it's like Common Core for Education or some of these these new gun laws. Do you think there's anything we can do on the on a state level to kind of, I mean, claim our independence um, from the state? It's like there's nullification things like that, but do you think maybe we should be a little more politically active lo on the local level? Oh, definitely, absolutely. Um, I think that that's even more important than um, national politics. Right now in Ohio, we're fighting Medicaid expansion. And Governor Kasich, who's a Republican, who's supposed to be a conservative, is trying to expand Medicaid, which would end up adding to the federal deficit. And I, so I think that it's very important to stay on top of local politics. And what, what's so discouraging and um, is that it's impossible, absolutely impossible to pay attention to everything that's going on the, at the local level, the state level, and the national level. I mean, you can drive yourself crazy trying to keep up with all this. But I think that people need to be more involved locally, and that, that's a great start. Um, what, what can you do locally uh, that, that uh, affects change, Mary? Um, can you go, I mean, just talk about some of the things that you can do. Uh, I can talk about some of them. I can't tell you what some of our plans are right now that we're working oh, on. Right. No, no, no. I'm just saying, like, how would the average person go about getting involved? Okay. So covert stuff, huh? <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, so I would say, you know, join join a local meetup group that um, that shares your beliefs, and there are, there are tons of them out there. Um, run for a local committee. Help out the Libertarian Party because I know that there are a lot of local county Libertarian Party groups, and they are always looking for volunteers. So. That's a really good way to help. Absolutely. You know, one thing, too, like you're saying, it is, when you're talking about national uh, and state and, and local levels, it, it is overwhelming. Um, and, you know, sometimes it's best to pick an issue and be successful in that one issue. You know, there's so many people, if we can get more people involved, um, you know, you take this side, I'll take that side, hit them high, hit them low type of a thing. Um, but anyways, Mary, uh, Libertarian Girl... Thank you for coming on. I appreciate your time so much. Uh, go ahead and tell everybody where they can find you um, and maybe some stuff you're working on. Get people excited about what's coming out. Okay, so I just started my website, libertariangirl.org, not .com. I don't know who owns that. And obviously Facebook, um, facebook.com slash libertariangirlfreedom, Twitter at libertygirl8, and... I just started Women for Rand Paul, too. That's another Facebook page. We haven't gotten the website up yet, though, but we will. Very good. Um, and, uh, yeah, like I said, anyone that hasn't been to your Facebook page, go to her Facebook page. Uh, like it. See the memes. Good stuff. I just look like looking in the news feed and seeing all the, the clever stuff you have up there. So, um, again, thank you for coming on. Thank you for uh, helping us unleash uh, independence and promoting the principle of self-ownership. So thank you, Libertarian Girl. Thank you, guys. Unleashindependence.com